Alright, hello, and let's get that uh, cat shot out of the way. There's Cookie. Today we're going to be looking at uh, spoon carving knives and how to sharpen them. Now I'm not going to be going over complete sharpening technique and philosophy. I have a video on wood carving knives uh, and the sharpening of them. And uh, go check that out. Uh, try to get down the basics of sharpening and then come on back here and uh, we'll look at this. There's some very particular things about a spoon carving knife, um, most of them, that... Uh, you're going to run into while sharpening. So a spoon carving knife is a chisel grind. It means there's a, a bevel on one side and it's generally flat on the other side. So if you have a flat side on a tool, whether it's a gouge, chisel, or spoon carving knife, uh, and it's polished and is undamaged, you do not sharpen that side. Now this is a mistake and solution for about half of the information and people out there. Um, they have uh, materials and tools and strops or sanding jigs they make uh, to scrape up the inside of their tool for no apparent reason. Um, now this may be confusing because you do this with a knife. A knife you want is a, is a double beveled tool and you want it to be in the middle. Um, so here I'm kind of drawing out that that's the profile of the blade. It's just chiseled and so it will be scooping in from there and, and pushing up the the uh, wood chips as you see there that little swirl so on that tip um, and why it's basically like this is um, when it's pushing through the wood it's a bit like um, an airplane wing you know um, and uh, you maybe studied at some point you know um, how the profile of an airplane wing uh, affects the the wind or this also could be in water or whatever um, it's basically pressures that go onto it so when a, a blade goes into wood it's going to have pressures on it from either side depending on the bevel or the shape of the bevels is to, depends on which way the blade is going to be naturally pushed towards so in a knife like this or a blade like this tool you don't want the blade to just keep going straight into the wood so you have the bevel on one side which means when it goes down sorry this is going to go out of frame a little bit my drawing it's going to go in there and then the wood's going to be pushing on the underside and not the top and it's going to push it forward and it's going to push it on an arc like you see there and it's going to pull out a piece of wood and remove the tool on its own through a natural motion of force so again um, as long as the tool isn't like vintage and it hasn't been rusted and doesn't have pitting um, if it's mirror polish on that flat side um, or non unbeveled side then I'd leave it alone um, maybe a little tiny bit of stropping uh, just to help get that very flexible uh, burr off but other than that uh, you may you mainly just work on the one side what I'm trying to illustrate here is um, one of the problems with a secondary bevel which is what you call um, putting a bevel on the other side is um, you're gonna severely decrease how sharp the knife is uh, how much slicing power it has um, you're that that bevel the angle is going to be added on to the one that was already there and it's basically going to double it for the most part if it's at the same angle and the knife is going to be, um, it may still be sharp, but uh, just really lose any of its cutting ability in wood. So you would have to take back the natural bevel that was put on there most likely. Um, and, and it may not be as stable of a, a tool at that point. One of the keys to sharpening is really committing to the bevel that's there. And if you let the uh, tool rock or you round the nose over through carving or through sharpening, um, you're going to have to go to the top of that round over and you have to take that bevel all the way back and it's going to be a lot of steel so uh, you want to be very careful uh, when you're sharpening and using this tool um, make sure that it does the tip does not get damaged so I was trying to show here um, that this knife just kind of has some lines and stuff I, I just wasn't able to really catch it on film um, basically it's starting to show just a few little signs of uh, the edge having a little bit of wear on it from me using it and um, this walnut's just too kind of crazy on its own and those cuts are still pretty clean so um, you really want to stay on top of your sharpening of these tools because it is so hard to work with them as you'll see in a little bit I'm going to be using uh, diamond uh, DMT products here um, I generally don't use curved stuff either uh, It's it would be too expensive to have something curved for all these and um, it, it's just not really necessary so I put this on a block very specifically because you see the back of this is at a funny angle because it sticks back it would depend on the tool but um see there I have to get it a little bit higher up so that the 
it will allow the handle to go down enough to hit all the, the angles on this thing. Basically to handle this you're going to take it in sections and for the most part I won't go uh, side to side which I generally don't do a whole lot of when I'm even doing a regular knife um, because of the ro the rocking factor which is you know when you uh, push it forward and backward like you would normally see on a strop or something um, it's going to create pressures and um, if you can't keep it consistent it's going to make it rock back and forth and that's just going to be catastrophic to your edge so basically I just go up and down this is what I mean by that it's just kind of doing these small little things and so with this curved blade obviously um, I do it in sections and then for this top part I basically change my grip up I generally use this kind of deal for this um, really whatever is comfortable for you so when you set uh, the the blade on there you want to make sure that it's flat on there and um, and that the edge of the tool there's no shadow under it that it's touching and of course you don't want it too far forward as well if you have it's been rounded over time um, or it's been damaged the bevel um, and it's not sitting on there flat and it's like kind of wobbling around then you need to go to a rougher grit lower grit and um, you need to set the bevel which means you need to basically redefine the whole thing make it flat make it go all the way to the edge and then go up through the grits and you'll be able to set it on that bevel and um, when it's sitting on that bevel it will be sharpening the edge of the tool and it'll be kind of a built-in uh, sharpening jig on there um, it, it's very hard to work with a, a tool sharpen when you don't have that or you don't have an incredibly stable elbow and wrist um, it's important to protect your tools not let them drop on the floor bang up against other metal things um, because it will do damage to the edge very easily it's very um, fragile on the tip there so make a sheath for it keep it in a safe place um, uh, I, I don't I, did you see my sheath in the beginning maybe it's just a very simple piece of leather that I can slide on there that's totally enough um, just did some rough sewing stuff on there anyway the but um, I think because the way these are uh, the way they work in wood they're not just making um, straight cuts they're very specifically making sweep cuts that are curved and that kind of pries with the tip so I think they're a little bit more prone uh, to getting damage on the tips you know very small uh, chips that you may not be able to see but uh, you know when you s certain kinds of wood they'll leave little tracers in the wood you can see that it's um, yeah, it needs to be fixed up you know e Early in my spoon career, I mean, I was sanding everything anyway, so it didn't matter a whole lot for that stuff. But I don't know. At the same time, you still want to stay on top of it because of how hard it is to get these back in shape if you let them fall too far behind. So uh, the sharpening of these is not real exciting, um, not super mind blowing or anything like that. It's really kind of uh, scaling back the ideas and tools. Um, you really just use what you have. Um, and uh, like I said before, I mean, that's really half the battle, maybe more of it. Um, I, yeah, I, again, I was talking in the other sharpening video about how much stupid stuff there is out there and how much of it that I did myself. Um, and there's a lot of stuff for shaping, you know, these kinds of things, um, spoon knives. And there's a lot of videos of guys, you know, wrapping sandpaper around a dowel to scratch up the inside of their tool. Or make their tool thinner for some reason. I don't know. Um, but you know, those same guys you'll see them. They'll maybe have a spoon video, and they they're really just tearing out the wood for the most part, and then they have to sand finish. You know, the the spoon. And look, if it's your first spoon, you know, fine. But don't teach other people that stuff. Um, anyway. I don't know. I guess that's that's all that was out there at the time. So I didn't know any better. I did the same thing. And um, there wasn't really any uh, good spoon knives around when I started. Um, so I learned to make my own, and that kind of really made me uh, learn about how they work and, uh, of course, how to sharpen them. But, um, you know, Paul over at Deep Woods Ventures started making some. There was some other people that made some, but they were um, they're apparently too thin, and um, people said they were only they would only really work for finishing. Um, the Europeans have been a little bit ahead of us in in the spoon carving department. 
And uh, there's been some guys uh, that have made them over the years that have been decent, but um, you know, very limited supply and um, hard for people to get. And um, I was really uh, kind of came out of the school of Robin Wood and Barn the Spoon, which are some European guys that um, do great work. It's very historically based, and uh, they take a very knowledgeable approach to spoon carving. And um, Robin was having an issue getting enough spoon knives because he was teaching classes. So he eventually found some people to start making some. But again, it's over in Europe, and he um, charges, even besides the ridiculous uh, shipping fees, um, you know, they're a little bit too much. But if you are over there, you know, you're listening to this, watching this, and you're across the pond, um, then go check out Robin Wood's uh, website and, and uh, see if he's still got some of those available. Um, you can order them from Deep Woods. Uh, he does ship uh, overseas, so uh, if you need to do that, go ahead. Um, but uh, these are, I'm really happy to uh, try one of these out. Uh, this is the smaller one. Uh, the spoon video will be coming out in a few days. Um, hopefully by the time you watch that, the date is not uh, important relevant but um yeah you want to keep it thick though it's very important that these tools are thick um because they're really long you know they don't seem like it but it's a lot of metal and uh, carbon metal um, is springy it's used as springs and um when it's basically when it's too thin or too long or whatever the ratio is you know when it's pushing too hard it basically it twists or bends and then the edge isn't pointing forward anymore and that causes bad results it doesn't carve um, so you have to make them thicker like this um, there is the whole making a quality knife thing but after you have a quality knife and you have a shape um, that's the main ingredient is making it thick so um, Mora does make a spoon knife, um, but it's kind of notoriously uh, upsetting compared to their straight knives, which um, most people enjoy. You know, um, almost nobody has th bad things to say about the Mora straight knives, but um, not many people have good things to say about the, the spoon knives. Um, so I'm moving on to the strop here. Kind of just rambled over the whole sharpening process there. Uh, and I'm scraping off kind of the old compound. Um, you're going to keep some leather kind of exposed a little bit. And you just don't want like a... The compound will mix up and you'll kind of lose your fresh stuff. And uh, you want that to stay on top. And also if it gets too much, it'll get muddy and then it'll roll your tip. Even when you keep your blade straight. So I'll kind of apply some of this and smear it around. Okay, so I'm put a little bit on the edge here. And that is going to be our very expensive um, contoured inside of the hook uh, jig. I'm just going to rub that on there. Smear it everywhere. Yeah, I've been losing my hoof print in the compound. I don't know if you guys saw that. It's pretty sad. Um, I'm going to make my own mold of a hoof print and so I can stamp it in there like an ashtray um, all the time. And then, I don't know. All of one. So, okay, on the strop here, um, I am going to go side to side because you can't just go up and down. Now, if you want to go up and down, I'll show here in a little bit, um, then you just basically go slowly over to your right or whichever direction it is so that you're actually zigzagging and you're not cutting in. Okay, here we go. I'll show you there. Um, and that'll work too. But really, the strop is different from the stones. It has a different kind of, um, has a different amount of tension and resistance. And also, um, you can't press this hard, um, you, or you press differently. You don't want to press hard on any of the stones or on the strop. But on the strop specifically, you can't press on it at all, or else it'll sink into that leather and it'll round over the tip. You really don't want to do that. So here I am doing the inside. This blade, um, it kind of looks like in some of my stropping, this, I actually angle it even more because I'm not catching the, the edge here. Um, it kind of looks like I'm going in, but it's it's not. It's just the way that the blade is shaped. Um, so you kind of need to look at it from the inside and um, you know see if you're catching the edge of it to get that burr off. And uh, anyway, like I was saying, I do go to the side on this, and you really want to kind of float the tool um, because you don't want to push it in 
and it also there is a little bit of resistance so you kind of have to lock up your hand and um, kind of go with that movement and I would suggest going slower um, and I think I ended up doing some off-camera stropping on this um, this whole session was a little bit short because it was already sharp it didn't need any work really so plan you know uh, you're gonna be doing a little bit more but uh, you know stropping you generally do a lot of and because this has to be broken up into sections and it's not as fast you know plan to, to take some time you really want to have patience with all the sharpening stuff it's you're just gonna waste so much time and energy if you don't um, you're not gonna be saving any time cutting corners when you're sharpening so here we go going back to this inside you can see it barely fits if my uh, strop was any thicker the wood that's on uh, this wouldn't really work for this particular tool so you may need to get some leather and uh, put it onto something uh, to do this part of the strop uh, but most likely you, you won't have to and if you don't have some extra leather around your super secret tip of the day is that the inside of a cereal box is one of the best strops available uh, you're going to want to use that cardboard. Uh, you could also use uh, the inside of a, uh, a soda container, that, that cardboard, or a beer, you know, like a 12-pack kind of, that cardboard's the same. Um, all cardboard is pretty good, but uh, for the most part, like if it's a box, it's going to have like a, it's not going to be unfinished cardboard. Uh, it's going to be like a little smoother. For, I don't know what they do to it, but uh, and, and also it's going to have that backing, so it's going to be way too soft and it'll round over your nose. So you get that cardboard from the cereal box, and it'll be real uh, kind of tougher. You can lay it down and not have to worry about it uh, sinking in the knife sinking in. Um, it really is an amazing strop, um, and uh, you can put some stropping compound on there, and then hit it up on a bare part and get a really nice edge going on there. And it's disposable and um, and of course you can uh, wrap it around whatever you want to make yourself a contoured strop if uh, the desire so strikes you. Alright, so time to check out the fruits of our neighbors. Uh, you know, time to put my money where my mouth is, see if I've screwed up this knife or if it uh, still carves wood. And here we go, drum roll please. And oh right, I've been carving for like years, so wasn't that exciting so there you have it uh, and I'm gonna go over some other uh, random stuff here real quick but uh, if you've had enough I'll see you next time so I'm just gonna quickly go over some alternative sharpening things if it's damaged or um, if you're having some performance issues so what I'm doing here in the background is showing you what you would do if the inside of your spoon knife is damaged or uh, you have put a secondary bevel on there already uh, you know you would wrap some sandpaper uh, around the end of anything really and just kind of do this movement here um, basically the opposite of what we were doing before uh, but in that situation you have to have something curved um, and really this isn't even shaped to it but it would work and you go up through the you know the your sandpaper as high as it goes hopefully you have something that goes up to a thousand or higher and uh, you wrap around anything, you know, any kind of handle, whatever is round, even a little bit, that's going to work for you. Um, if it's really, if it's too big and if it's the exact shape or size, then um, you're not going to be able to move it at all, so it's going to cause problems. So there's the flex cut piece of crap. You use that too on the edge there. Um, so that's like a 1200. Hopefully you could get that or maybe even higher. And then after that, you need to go to something like this, uh, which is like the uh, micro sandpaper. Uh, it's like sanding film. It's called uh, different things, um, but uh, it goes up to like uh, 0.5 microns, something very small, uh, so that you could get it to a strop. But if you, you can't just leave it at a thousand or 600 on sandpaper, um, you have to bring it back to a mirror polish somehow. So you got to have some steps in there that are flexible that you can bring it up there with. So the other thing I wanted to go over was uh, rounding over the heel uh, on a chisel grind, um, and I this you do sometimes for um, gouges and chisels uh, but it also does apply to the spoon knife and I want to be clear that this is not something that necessarily makes the tool better if it's not there it doesn't mean that the tool is uh, is broken and um, you really shouldn't do it unless you specifically run into some of the problems um, that I'll talk about 
um, it does change the way that the tool works so be let's be clear on that so what I'm trying to draw here is basically when it's flat the heel point and the uh, edge point are going to be the only things touching the wood once you have that uh, shape already dug out so you just curve the heel a little bit just the heel you're leaving the bevel flat you're gonna have a flat bevel uh, just to heal a tiny bit that helps it sweep a little smoother but also it gives it uh, a little bit more uh, surface area that's touching uh, the wood and that means that more of the blade is be is supporting the edge of the knife uh, of the of the blade and um, if you know anything about planes or anything when the tool when the blade is being pushed in a direction that's not um, straight towards its point it can still cut as long as it's being supported enough that uh, that kind of push war is still won uh, by the steel that it's not being um, flexed basically and so that the it's basically still winning the push battle with the wood so if you were running into that you were running uh, you're basically digging out uh, holes that are a little bit deeper um, basically you'll be cutting and there'll be lines that'll get it'll get caught the edge front edge will get caught when you're trying to do a sweep and one way to do it is just to carve more gently do a, a more passes with less aggression but the other thing you know this is what I do because I'm impatient and I like to kind of power carve so this is what you would do you would kind of I have this on a flexible on the leather some sandpaper and um, making sure I'm not screwing up the bevel or the tip I'm just rounding it out just a tiny bit it's it's so subtle you have to be very careful that you're not um, messing up any other part of the blade and um, I'm not going to go up through a, you know, a whole ton of grits on this uh, because it will get smoothed out over time anyway as I strop and as I carve um, so I just kind of do like a 12,000 and then I, I hit the strop for a little bit and that should be enough um, because it's not the uh, the cutting part of the blade necessarily so um, it kind of just depends on the rest of the shape of the tool. You really want to take this uh, each case at a time. Maybe try it on something on a tool that's not as substantial as this to, to see what the differences are. Um, it's something that's been beneficial for me, so I wanted to bring it up. But I want to be very clear that um, if, if you're a beginner um, or you're not sure about it, you definitely um, should not try this um, because it, it is hard to bring the tool back from that. You really, and I'm not sure if you really even can. You're gonna have to lose a lot of steel, so. Uh, just keep it in mind. All right. So that's going to be it. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video. And uh, any questions, comments, please leave them. I try to check them often. Or you can uh, hit me up at nosubject13 at yahoo.com. And uh, until next time, God save guys. Oh, my God.